So everybody knows we you know we bring you the best of the best on the orthopedic show, and and this episode is going to be really cool. I mean, not only are we bringing you the best of the best, but he's one of my my dearest friends on the planet, and we've known each other for three decades. And he's Dr. William Levine, who's uh, the the chairman and professor at Columbia University. He is a remarkable human being on the planet within orthopedics. He has trained. Uh, some of the greats, his legacy of his fellows and residents extends across the country, if not the world. Uh, he is just such an important person on how orthopedics has really developed over the last three decades. And uh, most importantly for me in particular, I, I get to call him friend. And this episode is really just about sharing our stories of our, our great professional career together. And I know you're going to love it as much as I do. We continue to thank our sponsor, OrthoLaser Orthopedic Laser Centers. They continue to offer MLS M8 technology for chronic and acute orthopedic pain as an alternative source to opioids and possibly even avoiding surgery. The franchise has continued to spread across the country. It's an amazing opportunity for orthopedic surgeons and doctors and even medical device reps to become part of the growing technology. OrthoLaser Milwaukee and OrthoLaser Rochester just opened. We have another five in the queue. Come and join the Ortho Laser franchise family. Hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is the Ortho Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where we bring you the best of the best in the orthopedic world. And I am really excited for today's episode. We have Dr. William Levine, who is the Frank Stinchfield Chairman of Orthopedic Surgery at Columbia Medical Center, or as I like to call, the professor. Uh, he is also the editor-in-chief of the Yellow Journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. And I could literally spend the next 35 minutes going through his CV and all of the amazing th things that he has done in the orthopedic world. But we're going we're gonna to skip that and get right into the fun stories, because the next thing that Dr. Levine is, is now he is the official fact checker of the Ortho Show podcast. That's going to have to pop onto his CV. But most importantly, he is one of my dearest friends on the planet. Welcome. Dr. Bill Levine. Siggy, nice to see you, my friend. Oh, it is always a pleasure to see you. It's so excited. I know that you spent a little time on the Ortho Show before my arrival as the host, but we have such a rich history. I felt that we had to get you back on and really uh, talk about some fun stuff in our 25 to 30 years that we have known each other. That'll be the first uh, fact check of the night, Sig. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so here's the first fact. So July 21st, 1964, William Levine is born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Exactly right. Okay, so fact number one, we're on a roll here, people. <laughs> this is all good. So your father's a urologist, your mother's a lawyer, not yet a Supreme Court justice, but you're in Canada. They decide they want to pop over the border and they want to move to a shtetl in Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> Does the audience know what a shtetl is? No, I think we have to probably explain that. <laughs> It's a small Jewish village. I think that's what it is, but I think it's pretty close. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Heather, do a fact check on that for us, please. Uh, no, I think it's fantastic. So that's, a, I mean, that's a really interesting story in and of itself. Just tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, you know, my my uh, my dad was a urologist. He uh, he had, uh, and he and my mom were both from Winnipeg. They wanted to uh, practice medicine in Canada. But the, the Canadian healthcare system was a, a real disaster. And then they had a they had a, a kind of a family tragedy, Sig. I don't know if you even know it, but I had an older brother named Jamie who died of SIDS uh, at age six months. Totally normal, healthy kid. And he would have been the fourth Levine kid. So they moved back to Winnipeg for a period of time because my mom was, you know, obviously totally uh depressed and and so tragically stricken 
And so they moved back to try to make Canada work and it just didn't work. And so they moved back to the, I was born. Um, I was the makeup child for Jamie who passed away. And then after three months, I like to joke, I crawled across the border and they made the, uh, the escape to Fargo four hours due south of Winnipeg. And then that's where I grew up. And so dad obviously was a major influence as a doctor. And then, uh, I mean, I absolutely love your post of your mom on LinkedIn the other day for, for women's day. And your mom is a, is Supreme court justice for the, uh, for North Dakota, which is really quite remarkable. Is she still practicing? No, no, no. So mom, yeah, mom was crazy, crazy story. You know, she, she did what women did in those days. She got married at age 19, uh, dropped out of college, um, had five kids, six with, with Jamie, but had five kids and uh, then picked up her college degree piecemeal. And then, um, you know, at my dad's various stops as a, as a doctor. And then uh, in 1971, they were living in Fargo. I was seven. My little brother, David, was four and a half, two years younger than us, than me. And she said, you know, she said to my dad, Leo, I'm, you know, I want to do something. I feel like, you know, I've sacrificed and, you know, no, no guilt, but I just want to do something else. And I've got these five great kids, but I want to, you know, do something for myself. And so they literally wrote, sat down and wrote on a piece of paper what she was interested in. And, and uh, they came up with this list and they kind of came to the conclusion that law school was the, the best pathway for her to achieve what they wrote down on that piece of paper. And the only law school in North Dakota is in Grand Forks, which is 90 miles from Fargo. So she makes an appointment to meet with the dean of the law school. Now, remember, it's 1971. She drives there, sits down with the dean, who was a man, of course, and tells her what her plan was. And he looked at her with a straight face and in a non-condescending way, actually, very matter-of-factly said, you know, I think, Burl, that you're just a spoiled doctor's wife and you won't be motivated enough to do this. And, um, and she looked back at him and said, you know what, I, I think you need to give me a chance. And to his credit, he did and accepted her. So she drove back and forth 180 miles a day for three years graduated number one in her class and then joined, uh, uh, you know, the most prestigious law firm in Fargo where she practiced until um, 1985. Now I'm a junior at Stanford and I get a phone call and she's like, yeah, you know, um, uh, my name's on the short list for the Supreme court. And I said, <laughs> what? That's awesome. and, and it was a great story because there was a Republican governor, great politics story. Uh, incumbent Republican in the red state of North Dakota who had no chance of losing whatsoever, had like a 95% approval rating. And then every month leading up to the election, he did one more terrible thing than the next. And he ends up losing. And the Democratic governor uh, decides to uh, put my mom in as the first female Supreme Court judge, first Jew uh, in the history of North Dakota. So it's a great story. Oh, that's an amazing story. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, for sharing that for everyone. Uh, no, really amazing. So so here you are. So now you're in Stanford, okay? And then you decide you're going to go to medical school, follow in dad's shoes. You go to Case Western. And then uh, you and I meet up at the, at the Tufts Combined Orthopedic Residency in Boston, where we are residents together. And then we become co-chief residents as well. And, uh, you know, what a, what a great what a great training ground we had. Don't you think? I mean, we had the Tufts program was making really good orthopedic surgeons in the day when we were there with Mike Goldberg at the helm as the chairman. Well, you know, I think if you look at the number of, of orthopedic chairmen around the country who trained at Tufts, it's a, it's pretty damn impressive. Um, and it wasn't known for being an academic powerhouse. And in fact, I remember vividly when I did my first paper as a PG2 with John Richmond, um, that was both incredible, but also uh, a little bit daunting because they weren't used to residents doing that. And, you know, you know what happens in residency. If you show some closing ability, then all of a sudden you get coming out of the woodworks, you know, faculty saying, hey, I've got this project and I got the worst thing you can ever hear as a resident is I've got a slam dunk for you. So the <laughs> residents out there, run, don't walk, run away when you hear a faculty member tell you that. 
I mean, you were so far ahead of your time. I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm so funny because I've actually pulled out your CV and I look at all the papers and I was, you know, now I like interviewed, you know, uh, Dr. Dandar from, from University of Miami. He's got, he's got, you know, 30 papers already published and he's a chief resident. That's what they're all doing now. They're all into research early on. But back in the day, you know, it, this sort of stuff sort of fell in your lap. It wasn't like it was mandatory to do this type of aggressive research. So you were absolutely a leader, which leads me to one of my favorite stories. So, you know, so you you get with Ben Rosenberg and J.R. Richmond, who's one of the iconic leaders of sports medicine in our country, who's, who's pretty much retired now. And and you write this seminal paper on the long term follow up of bank cards and the incidence of of shoulder arthritis. And it's actually a really important paper and it uh, gets published. And of course, you get, you know, picked to go down to the academy and you're going to present your paper. So, you know, two of your dear friends, <laughs> Ramin Modaver and myself, go down to New Orleans and let's just say we had ourselves a little too good of a time the night before your presentation. Well, can we can we qualify who we is? <laughs> it would be me and me <laughs> because it wouldn't be we including me. <laughs> no, it was definitely not including you. You showed up on time for your presentation. But let's just say that Ramin and I slept through it. And so you have to tell the, our listeners right now about what you typically did for about the next 10 years uh, for every other academy meeting when, when Ramin and I showed up. Well, it, it goes without saying when your best friends, you know, completely leave you high and dry uh, for, you know, it's a big deal. You're a resident. You're presenting at the academy. That, like that's like, you know, you're, you're all excited, but you're nervous. Uh, so for the for the next 20 years. Uh, every time I go to the academy, um, I send Scott and Ramin my agenda of all of the talks I'm giving, whether they're ICLs or symposium or whatever, so they know exactly where not to be uh, during that academy. So <laughs> you, that, didn't, you didn't want us to accidentally walk into what he did. I wanted no pop ins. An accidental pop in would be way out of the question. <laughs> Oh, this is fantastic. So, so yeah, but, you know, fortunately we stayed friends despite our failure to, uh, to back <laughs> you up there, uh, professor. And, uh, and so then it comes time for fellowship. And I love telling this story too, because, you know, you and I were co-chief residents together at the home ship at, at New England Medical Center for six months. How am I doing fact checker? Am I doing okay? That's good. That's okay. better. That's better than the last three shows. <laughs> 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 All right. So we're co-chief residents together. We're both kind of really digging the whole sports thing, but you're really sort of maybe thinking maybe the shoulders really where you want to go and be like a, a super shoulder specialist, which was well before the time. There weren't a lot of really focused, isolated shoulder fellowships back then. It was really more about. There were only, there were only four at that time, Sid. Yeah. So there you go. So four at that time. And then there were a bunch of really good sports medicine fellowships. So you and I decide that we're both going to apply to the Curl and Joe uh, Fellowship out in Los Angeles. And it was pretty apparent that they weren't going to take two of us from the same program. And you had also applied, obviously, to Louis Biliani's Fellowship at Columbia, where you were going to do a shoulder fellowship. And uh, you graciously decided to back out of your Curl and Joe you know, application so that your good friend, Scott Sigmund, could uh, have an opportunity to go, which I did. So to this day, I have to thank you for uh, the participation of my fellowship at Curl and Joe. Well, I, I got to tell you, that was a very awkward conversation when KJ called and said, you know, how much do you really want to do sports versus shoulder? Because, you know, if you come here, we're not sure about Scott. And I'm like, you can't put that pressure on me. Come on. <laughs> exactly. uh, but, you know, you know what? It, it was uh, it was awesome because um, uh, you got to go to KJ and I went to Columbia. And those were the days for the listeners and for the young residents. There was no match. And so it was the total wild, wild west. Um, and you saw, you know, for those of you who think for a moment that you don't want to have a match for a fellowship or residency, just call us offline and we can tell you the horror stories. Because as as challenging as the match is, without a match, it's uh, it's really bad. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was stressful times for sure. And uh, but you know, I look at look at the amazing time we had there and all the great accomplishments that we've had. So it's been uh, again, I, I hearken back to our residency and our time together and training and. You know, it was uh, it was it was it was a t it was a lot of work. I mean, we spent a lot of time in the hospital back then, and uh, but it was worth it for sure. And, and we all came out. Most of us as really good orthopedic surgeons, really able to operate and take care of our patients. So, well, that that was the tough the, that was the tough mo was to train clinically 
outstanding orthopedic surgeons. And if you did research, that was on your own and that wasn't like what they were known for, but they were, they were definitely known. You look around the entire Boston area and it's just littered with outstanding clinical orthopedic surgeons that have gone out into practice and had stellar careers. Uh, and then there's another, you know, smaller group that were interested in academics and were able to follow that pathway as well. Yeah. So give the shout outs, man. Let's who's our, who are our chairman across the country? We've got we got a cadre. Well, you got Ben Allman. Uh, you got Chuck Cassidy. Um, those are the the three right now, I think. And, and with me, those are the three right now. But, you know, you've got Marty O'Malley, who's crushing it at HSS and is just, you know, been he's he's kind of the go to foot and ankle guy for the NBA now and for other professional leagues. Of course, you got our one of our favorite mentors, Ken Levitsky. Uh, and, you know, talk about getting old and gray hair. Uh, I'm now training his son, Matt, who's a oh, fourth year. He's a fourth year resident. Um, and uh, Matt's applying for adult recon fellowships. And we'll find out uh, on April 20th where he's going to be spending that special extra year. Um you know, so it's it was a really it was a special time. Ramin Modaber, who you talk about on every ortho show, so I'm going to talk about him today. I mean, you know, Ramin Ramin's just a special person. He's you know amazing doctor, outstanding surgeon, but just a great person. So, you know, it was uh, it was a very special time for us, uh, no certainly, question. Certainly was. My favorite Ken Levitsky story is I'm at the, I'm at the the VA with him and. There's a Morton's neuroma that needs to be done. You know, Ken's a, a foot and ankle guy. He dissected out every nerve in the foot and wrote like 17 papers about the nerves of the foot. And I look over at him. I'll make a PGY2. And, and he's like, he's like a, a five. And I said, you know, hey, Ken, why don't we give this one to the medical student? And he looks over at me. He's like, he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, how many Morton's neuromas have you done? I said, I haven't done any. <laughs> he's like, to this day, we remember that story. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite Marty O'Malley story is, is uh, we're, we're, I don't know, we're in some academy meeting or something. And, and he's, this is like five years, six years ago. And he starts talking about how he goes to work and this and the other and how crazy busy he is. And he's like, yeah, you know, and I have my driver and I get all my work done. I said, oh, really? I've got a driver too, but it sits in my golf bag. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Marty. I don't have a driver, but uh, no, great, great guys, great history. And uh, it's really, really a lot of fun reminiscing about them for sure. All right. So look, so so you go, you, you take over New York by storm. It's 1998. You come in, you you basically, you, fit, you, you do your fellowship. Then you go and do another fellowship for sports medicine, University of Maryland. You go out to San Diego for a year and then you come back and you decide, I'm going to be on staff at Columbia or they decide they want you to be. You become the team physician. And then you're just on this, this sort of rocket ship of orthopedic uh, knowledge and you're doing team coverage. You're getting on journals. You're doing boards, your education and papers. You're kicking ass and taking numbers. And in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, Fact checker, here we go. Nine years after joining Columbia, you were made a full professor at Columbia University. Yeah. That's kind of a big deal. Um, yeah, you know, it. Um, I was, I think like everything you get, you, you, you have your situations and if you're lucky enough, you take advantage of those situations. So the reality is that um, I came to Columbia at a time where it was ripe for the taking. Uh, Louis Biliani had become chair. He gave me this incredible opportunity to take the world-renowned shoulder service and basically make a de novo sports service, which didn't exist. So there I am, I'm 33 years old, and I was able to basically create something from scratch that you wouldn't think you'd be able to do at a place like Columbia. And, you know, we had no teams we had no sports medicine. We had no non-operative sports medicine doctors, nothing. Um, and, you know, today, um, Chris Ahmad's the team physician for the New York Yankees and for New York City Football Club. Tishon Lynch is the team physician for Fordham. I take care of Columbia. Dave uh, Trofa takes care of Manhattan. We've got about eight colleges, 45 high schools. Tom Bottiglieri is a non-op sports guy who's just crushing it. So it's it's been amazing just from the sports side of things to be able to have been able to kind of have a part in that um, growth, which was really, you know, it, uh, again, very, very unique. And when I mentor so many people now, which is one of my passions, 
you know, when you have that opportunity to do something, you know, and not be the 10th guy on the team, but be the first or second and be able to create something in your own vision while, while nerve wracking and daunting, there's something really special about that. If you're given the, um, the resources to do it. And, and if you have the support to do it, uh, and I certainly did, I mean, the mentors I had that allowed me to get to where I've gotten is, uh, is something I talk about all the time and pay that forward as much as I possibly can. Well, you, you can't go, I mean, pre, pre COVID anyway, I could not go to a meeting, which I would attend routinely, you know, five, six, seven, where I could not run into a Bill Levine fellow. I mean, you're like, it's like Bill Belichick or Andy Reid. You know, you've got this, this, this legacy of fellows that you've created across the country that are unbelievable. I mean, they're just at the top of their game and must give you great satisfaction knowing that you've helped to treat them or train them. So you're really helping to sort of treat these patients that you've never met. It's a really cool thing. Yeah. Well, look, I think that, you know, for those of us that go into academics, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons people do it, but for me, uh, without question, the, uh, the, the lasting legacy, hopefully, and I, I said this the other day, I'm not, I don't spend much time on LinkedIn, but, but I got a, a note that Mike Gryway, one of my fellows who I know, you know, um, Mike posted on LinkedIn about a novel approach that he just got published for doing a posterior approach for total shoulders. And, and it just struck me like if what, what's so cool about having fellowship and residency uh, is that you hopefully are going to have fellows and residents that are going to surpass you um, and be better than you. And, and there are some people that get threatened by that. And I'm so the opposite of that. Like I'm going to revel in your success so much uh, that more so than, oh, you know, I want you to fail because that makes me look like the big guy. I I couldn't think anything further. So when I see Mike Ryway doing great, or I mean, I see Steve Goldberg, one of my fellows, Scott, who basically started a revolutionary total shoulder system in his garage. It's a total game changer. It's FDA approved. It's going to get bought by one of the big companies and it's totally transformative. It's it's a it's a disruptive technology, uh, unlike anything on the market. And he utilized the Columbia Shoulder uh, Network. And every meet every year we have a meeting, and he would come and he would iterate. He'd talk to some of our alumni. He would change and tweak things. But he noticed things about the standard total shoulders being in private practice down in Naples, Florida, that as a private guy with one assistant. He wasn't, he didn't like some things that were standard. And he said, why are we doing this? Why do we cut the head of the humerus off instead of doing something like the total knee guys do with the distal femur? And he created a very uh, intricate, elegant uh, jig system based on anatomy uh, that it's an anatomic humor resurfacing prosthesis that's totally different. So when you see that kind of stuff and and you see that from from your former fellows, uh, it gives you an incredible sense of pride and joy that they're going out and doing some really great stuff. Yeah, no, Heather, you got that. It's Steve Goldberg, correct? Do I have that correct? Yeah. All right, Heather, we got another guest on the Ortho Show podcast. We'll be in touch for sure. But then we hear a lot of that, you know, Bill, on, on entrepreneurs that come on the show, you know, innovative thinkers that think outside the box. You're trained. I think what's great is that you're not, you know, the truly great orthopedic surgeons are not trained in operations. We, we, we train them on how to think, you know, about issues and be able to solve the problems and, and maybe move something from one space to another, like you said, from a total knee to a shoulder shoulder. So that's fantastic. Love, love that story. So what, all right. So I want to, I want to change it up a little bit. It's a very direct question and it is, when did you exactly cancel a chromioplasty for the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got asked to do that. Um, I think it was Chris Harner asked me to do that study for the Herodicus Society. Herod- Herodicus Society is is uh, it's an interesting group. It's it's um it's a smaller group of uh, of sports medicine surgeons, and it really started out as kind of the the Young Bucks Club from AOSSM. So Jimmy Andrews and Bill Clancy and all of the giants in sports now uh, were kind of very young and they were up and coming and they were very nervous 
you know, to go to the academy or to go to AOSSM and present was kind of, as I said, nerve wracking. And especially when your friends desert you and don't show up to support you, it's even worse. <laughs> and so, so they started this group called the Herodicus Society. Um, and lo and behold, now fast forward, it's kind of become a, a very prestigious who's who in sports. Well, in any event, um, I, I have the uh, privilege of being in that group. And Chris Harner asked me to do a, to take a look at acromioplasty. And so Mark Vitale was one of our residents. Um, and um, so we, we used the uh, New York database Sparks and then the NISQIP database. And we were able to look at acromioplasty based on, I didn't kill it, but when 29826 lost its work RVUs, uh, that's when it got killed. And so it, it's an amazing story in orthopedics and in medicine to see a, a procedure which is absolutely an appropriate procedure in some patients, uh, just like Dr. Neer said. I mean, the best part about the acromioplasty is it's, you know, look at Neer's study. It was 50 patients. It wasn't 5,000 patients, you know. So Neer used it very judiciously. And, and before Neer talked about the anterior acromioplasty, the, the surgery of the day was destroying patients, lateral acromionectomy, total acromionectomy, partial acromionectomy. And Neer looked at the, went to the cadaver labs and said, hey, there's this spur on the anterior part of the acromion. Makes sense that we might want to remove that if you have a patient that seems to have pathology associated with it. So, of course, we got the scope and then we could do that on everybody. And you saw the complete bastardization of the original um, near uh, philosophy, and now all of a sudden, acromioplasty is it's the devil. So you know it, it'll it's sifted out right now. I think you know good surgeons realize it's not that you say you never do an acromioplasty. There are some patients where you have to do it, and it's appropriate. But if you've got a flat acromia, no no spur, no pathology, yeah, why why would you do something to that? All right, so we have to explain for Judy, for my mother, the acromion is a bone off your wing bone that's right right above your rotor cuff and uh, the rotor cuff, <laughs> the rotor cuff, <laughs> and uh, and 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 uh, built one of Dr. Levine's uh, initial sort of uh, professors from uh, from Columbia came up with this idea of removing that bone spur to help patients with pain. It became a very popular thing. Then arthroscopically, we could do it really well. And then everybody and their mother was doing acromioplasties on everyone. And then Dr. Dr. Levine went to the top of the mount and declared that acromioplasty does not work for all. And a surgical code essentially was removed from our ability to uh, to care for patients. And, you know, I used to say it all the time. I'm like, you know, the only two operations that I still do from residency are an arthroscopic acromioplasty and an arthroscopic partial medial meniscectomy. And that's really not the case anymore, is it? It's uh, pretty amazing how things change. Yeah, it really is. All right. So, you know, the good news about being in New York is that, you know, you're the big kahuna now. You're the chairman of Columbia for how many years now? Seven years now? Yeah. Seven years in. So it's pretty obvious that everybody on the planet is going to come and see Dr. Levine for their shoulder care. And there's no competition in New York. There's no other shoulder surgeon. So it's just super easy right now. You just go into work and they all just sort of roll in. One of my favorite stories that you used to tell is, you know, the woman comes in and she's got like four folders of stuff and she plops it down onto the table and she looks you right in the eye and says, Dr. Levine, why should you do my surgery? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's um, I learned very early uh, in this city. I mean, it is a, it, it's the, the greatest, um, you know, when you say there's a shoulder surgeon on every corner, there, there actually is a shoulder surgery shoulder surgeon on every corner in, in Manhattan. And if you look at the ASES, the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons Directory, and you look at the number of ASES members, full members that live in Manhattan, it's more than most states. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am I was a young guy. I was here maybe, uh, I think, third or fourth year in practice. And, and uh, Scott's telling a great story. This woman comes in. She's in her 70s. She has end-stage arthritis of her shoulder. She's failed all the appropriate non-operative management. She's really miserable. Her quality of life's negatively affected. All the things I go over with patients. And I said, look, you're at that point where either you're going to live with the symptoms if you could tolerate them, or you should get a shoulder replacement. And I had no gray hair back then as I do now. And she looked at me and she said, well, you know, 
I've seen this guy at HSS, his, his name's, uh, I've seen this guy at HSS, um, and why should you do the surgery instead of him? And I said, well, well, who is the guy at HSS? And she said, well, his name is uh, Dr. Ed Craig. And I said, oh, well, you know, Dr. Craig uh, designed the prosthesis that he's going to put in your shoulder. I think he's very comfortable with this operation. <laughs> so she looked at me and she thanked me and she walked out the door and went and scheduled her surgery with Dr. Craig. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So again, you know, so, so many great stories through, through the years. Here's one of our other common stories, which it still sort of blew me away. This is only about, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, but I've got this, a buddy of mine, he's a golfing buddy up in here and he's got a high grade partial tear of his rotator cuff. And he comes to me and I said, well, I've got this new novel technique that I'm doing, you know, the cow patch thing. And I know you've had some experience with the Regenitin implant as well, but so, you know, it was very early on. I said, yeah, but we've been doing it and I've had some good success. And, you know, he's like, okay, I trust you, Scott, you know, let's go ahead and do it. And then I get this phone call from him like a week later. He's like, hey, Scott, like, I know this is like a big deal, but I got this personal favor. You know, I live up in Maine and there's another orthopedic surgeon up in here and, and he doesn't really know anything about it, but he's a really good buddy of mine. Do you mind just, you know, sort of, you know, giving him a call? And I said, sure, you know, no problem. Do you, do you happen to have his name? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's Louis Biliotti. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, let me get this straight. <laughs> the professor of the professor for shoulder wants to talk to me about some new operation that I'm going to be doing on his friend. I'm like, this is going to go really well. <laughs> so sure enough, I call Louis, and what a sweetheart of a guy. I mean, he was just, you know, just so nice on the phone, and I explained the whole thing to him, and. I don't even think I had mentioned, you know, that you were using it or anything, but just as this is what we're going to do. And by the end of the conversation, he's like, oh, he's like, do you think, uh, are they taking investors? <laughs> you know, and then uh, <laughs> sure enough, we, we operate on the patient and he did really well. But I, I vividly remember our time together when you were, had decided you were going to do your fellowship with Louie and he came as a, as a guest professor at Tufts and, uh, and the two of us got to operate with him and we did a shoulder replacement. That was super cool. We did. That was really, a, that was kind of one of the cool things we would do. We would have the, um, the, the person we were going to do the fellowship would come during our chief year as a VP. Uh, and in those days we would get privileges for them. Uh, it's hard, you can't do that now. And so we would operate with our future fellowship directors. That was, you know, that was really special. You think about how cool that was. Um, that was really a special time. Yeah, no, no, it really was. So I want to do one last thing. It's kind of fun. You know, I, you know, once I realized that Bill Levine was actually Canadian born, you know, I started thinking about, you know, some of the great Canadians that that live, you know, in the U.S. And I sort of put together a little bit of a top five list. And so I'm going to put one up and I'd like to hear what yours might be. But I, I'm going to start off with the great one, you know, Wayne Gretzky. I mean, how could you not? Right. Great, great Canadian and great U.S. hockey player for sure. What do you got for you? Who's who's one of your favorite Canadians who now resides in the U.S.? Gosh. I don't know if I, I, I've got one for you. Let me think about that. Um, great Canadians who live in the U.S. There's a lot of musicians out there, Bill. Think about those, those, uh, those, how about like a Celine Dion? Everybody loves Celine Dion. Oh my Dion. God, I don't like Celine Dion. She drives me crazy. <laughs> oh, come on, Michael J. Fox. Come on, you got to love Michael have, J. Fox. I don't have any good Canadians for you. Tony Miniacci is a great Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm sure Tony will be thrilled to hear that. And you, come on, you got to go. You got to throw the beebs in there, Justin Bieber. As I always say, you know, you're going to come <laughs> into my operating room. It's going to be cold. Put on a sweater. We're going to open up some boxes and we're going to listen to Bieber. <laughs> uh, and of course, my top five has to round out. With Dr. William Levine. <laughs> well, that, that's very nice, Scott. Uh, Bill, this is fantastic. I was so looking forward to this show in particular. We have such a rich history together. You're, you know, you're such a dear friend. And, you you know, this is what we try to do on the Ortho Show is we bring these really incredible people that have made incredible contributions. And uh, I can't think of anyone more than you that has done that for the education of residents, for fellows and and, and really pushing the envelope for, for orthopedics in general. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to call you friend and colleague. Thanks, Sig. Uh, great job with the Ortho Show. Uh, it's really fun to see what you're doing with it and uh, all the great things that you're doing. And um, uh, I will continue 
my fastidious fact checking for all future episodes. I promise. You you now have an official title. It is no longer honorary. <laughs> this is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.